Coming up, a woman is rescued by an angel and prayer saves a teenage boy from a direct lightning strike. Welcome to 700 Club Canada. So glad that you joined us today. You know, often we miss out on what the grace of God looks like in our life. We think, oh, well, maybe the grace of God is available to, you know, only those really good people. Well, here's the truth. We are all covered by the what's called the common grace of God. Otherwise, our world wouldn't hold together. None of us would survive. And I just love that today's show, we're going to be talking about God's grace for you. Well, speaking of grace and truth, I want to introduce you to two of my friends, Donna and Kevin Carter. This is a mother and daughter team that created a podcast called Grow on the Go, highlighting the importance of growing in our relationship with God. Well, welcome to 700 Club Canada, ladies. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us. Well, your Grow on the Go podcast, it's in its fifth season. Congratulations. That's so awesome. Donna, tell us why you started the podcast and what listeners can expect. Sure. Actually, we finished our fifth season and we'll be starting our sixth in September. Great. Um, but I started the podcast because I, as a speaker and an author, um, I would, you know, I'd be out there at speaking engagements and, and often I would be one of the youngest women in the room. And I, I wondered, what are young women doing to grow in their faith? They're not going to retreats or conferences. They're not going to Bible studies. How are they growing? And I realized they are listening to podcasts. And so I thought, well, what if we could help young women grow on the go? Um, hence the name. Yeah. And so we, we, we try to pick relevant topics. We look at what the Bible has to say about them. We chat about how that's relevant in our culture. And, you know, Kevin is the demographic that we're trying to reach. So she was the logical co-host for me. Well, it's so great. I, I love it because you guys are so real. And that really connects, I think, with any age. Kevin, not everyone can work with their mother, let's be honest. So can you describe <laughs> your dynamic as a ministry team and what makes for a great mother-daughter connection? You know, I not everyone could work with their mother, but not every mother could work with me. Um, <laughs> I, our dynamic is very much mom brings a lot of insight and teaching, and I just mock her relentlessly the entire time, um, and it seems to work. Um, That's great. Realistically, mom and I are really similar in a lot of ways. We have very similar temperaments. We communicate very similarly, and I'm just a little bit more raw. I feel say? like in many ways, Kevin is a more honest version of me. Oh. So I think if I'd grown up in her generation, I would be a lot more like her. That's really neat. Yeah. Is, is that and, true, and so Kevin? I, well, I, I mean, I don't know if, if, if mom's being untruthful. I, I wouldn't know that unless she told me. <laughs> um, but we are very, we are very similar in a lot of ways, but we differ just enough that I think it makes for a really interesting dynamic. Um, and I, I, I don't know, I've never been anyone else's daughter, but I really think just respecting different viewpoints is really critical to like a good um, mother-daughter relationship and, and by extension podcast. And, um, and I think what makes our dynamic pretty compelling is that we have a lot of fun. And if something goes sideways, we joke about it and move on. That's right. Well, I think that's a really good point is the respect. I mean, I've got a daughter too, and I've got some daughter-in-laws, and I, I would agree with you, Kevin, on that. It works for really any relationship, right? Yeah. But well, Donna... I think the, the authenticity is really critical. We're, we, we are close, and so we are willing to share deeply with each other, and it just happens to be on the air some of the time. Yeah. It was funny, we went out for dinner with... Uh, Mike Kane, who or Matt Kane, sorry, he's the president of Faith Strong today. That's the platform that hosts our podcast. And um, he hadn't met us before. And we're just Kevin and I are sitting in the back seat of their car, and he, he says to his wife, "I feel like I'm listening to a podcast right now." <laughs> <laughs> that's just who we are together. Yeah. Well, that's what's so real and authentic about it. You're right, Donna. You both have a heart to see people have spiritual conversations with mm -hmm. unbelieving friends. I love how honest you are in your conversations. Tell us about your new monthly share show, you call it, and what the impact has been. 
Right. So we started the share, the share show. It's our last show of the month, every, every month. And it's designed to, um, for a, a, a woman of faith to share with her friend who doesn't yet know God. And then to follow up with a conversation afterward, to, to, to try and get that, make that, uh, build a bit of a bridge so that that conversation is a little bit easier um, to be able to say, okay, so what did you think about that share show on anxiety? Like, wh what did you like about it? What didn't you like? And, and get, get them to the, the five yard line in having a, a, a significant spiritual conversation. That's really good. Kevin, would you say the same for you? Like, have you seen an impact from those shows? Um, yeah, I think, I think the, the biggest impact that we can have is again, being authentic. And I think that's really what people are thirsty for, especially people that are seeking. Yeah. Um, and so that's where I see the biggest impact or, or at least potential for impact. Yeah. Well, I encourage people to check it out. You're right, it's on Faith Strong Today. That's the network that you're connected with. And Kevin, what would you say to our viewers about how to connect with the younger generation? I mean, you said, you know, really you're the target audience here and what matters the most to, to your generation? I think that's something that I could speak about at length. And, you know, it, it's interesting. I'm no longer, I'm a millennial. I'm no longer the youngest adult generation. Yeah. But I think it's fair to say that millennials and Gen Z, we want everybody and anybody to take responsibility and be authentic, which is something we've talked about this entire conversation. Um, and so I think the church has hurt a lot of people. And I think before we can get anywhere with um, younger generations, saved or not, we need to take responsibility for that hurt. We need to make restitution where we can. And we need to drop sort of the shiny, polished veneer of what being a Jesus follower is and has been for decades, if not centuries, and just be real people who are deeply, deeply flawed and covered by the grace of God. Yeah. Oh, I think that authenticity is the best way we can connect. So good. Well, we're going to be talking about the grace of God on this show. So thank you for just setting that up for us. Thank you for what you do, ladies. Keep doing it. Keep just having real conversations. Mm -hmm. And Do I believe it. you're podcast app that you go to uh, grow on the go, or you can go to faithstrongtoday.com and uh, all the icons are there. That's great. And we'll have all that information at 700club.ca. So check it out. And thanks again for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Our pleasure. Thanks. And now with her car teetering on the edge of a bridge, Christine experiences a miracle. Christine Martin lived every girl's dream. The newest clothes, the coolest shoes, and money to burn. I was used to having very, very nice things. and things actually had a hold on me. It was a matter of the thing and the home and the nice car and the country club or the yachts or the you know, driving around in, in beautiful things with your windows down so people could see you. But behind the country clubs and privileged lifestyle, Christine was living a nightmare. The molestation happened from the ages from three to 13. So it was happened a very long time of my life. It was forceful and not pleasant. Yeah, it was just really embarrassing and continual, a non-stop. The abuse came from not one, but two men in her extended family. But Christine never told a soul. I was this inner kid inside screaming, wanting to tell somebody, please help me. But I was told, do not say anything, do not tell your parents, no one is to know this is our secret. While the physical abuse eventually stopped, the emotional pain only got worse. I was very, very damaged, very hurting, very broken, lonely, uh, insignificant. I felt that no one wanted me. And just when she thought she couldn't feel any lower, she was raped at a party by a stranger when she was 16. I had this horrible, disgusting, dirty feeling relived all over again in this horrible dark stillness just captivated every part of me. I sat in the shower um, and almost made, I made myself bleed. You know, I scrubbed so hard and scratched my body and pulled my hair at its scalp. I just wanted to get every part that he had touched off me and away from me. As I told one girlfriend and she's like, oh, you better keep it quiet, you know, 
this is a good school and your parents and you don't want to make a, make a fuss. So I kept it quiet. Then her father lost his contracting business. She couldn't hide her pain behind a lavish lifestyle. And she used other things, drugs, alcohol, and promiscuity to mask her pain. I did not have any value for myself as a woman. Um, a body was just, you know, there's no respect for it. It's already been taken advantage of, so why does it matter to give it away? I would do drugs every single weekend, and whenever I could, almost several times during the week, I'd smoke pot, I would get high, I would skip school. But all that changed one day when she was 19. She had been joyriding with a friend. I lost control of my car, and my car had spun in 360s for about 50 yards. And I remember my car teetering over the edge of the bridge. I thought, oh my god, I'm going to die with a fish. You know, I didn't think about clothes. I didn't think about people. I didn't think about family. I cried out and said, dear god, please rescue me. That's all I remember uttering. And I remember as my car was on fire, teetering over this bridge, a huge, I know it was an angelic presence, about five stories tall, massive, wide in stature, just strong and gray-like, took my car, and it was like these hands almost swooped down like this, and took my car and teetered it right off the bridge onto the grass. My car door flung open, and I just remember rolling out and laying on the grass. While she was there, she thought about the angel that set her car to safety. Then she remembered going to church as a child and knew it was finally time to give her heart to Jesus. And there was this uncommon peace that I had not ever known that had come over my body and swept over my soul. And I felt for the first time in my life that I was valuable, that someone cared about this girl, that I was gonna be okay. And that day radically transformed my life. And it's like I fell in love with this Jesus that everyone had talked about, but I had never known. He became so real to me on that particular day, just as real as I'm talking about him now, that I knew that all the pain and all the tragedy and everything that I had gone through, you know, maybe was not in vain because at 19, there was still a purpose for my life and I wasn't gonna be some washed up druggie you know, whisking life away and using people the rest of her life. Christine is married now and has a wonderful son, Solomon. She and her husband love to share what Christ has done in their lives. My life is amazing. I know it's because I know who I am in Christ, that Jesus has become literally my friend. He's so real to me. He is the fiber of why I do what I do, why I breathe, why I live, why I exist. It is all because God showed me grace. Wow, what an encounter Christine had with God. And like she said herself, it was the grace of God in her life. See, God shows grace to everyone. She wasn't looking for God, but He certainly was looking for her. And she had this supernatural rescue from this angel. Literally, it changed her life. This is the key to her story that really stood out to me, is how she discovered who she was in relationship to Christ. See, she didn't know who she was before. She was really lost. She was searching for her identity in all kinds of things that actually gave her a feeling of uselessness, of being unloved. And yet when Jesus rescued her, she found purpose. She found the fact that she was loved. She was no longer useless. She was no longer abandoned. She was forgiven and valued. See, this is what the grace of God, this is a relationship with God and what it offers us. Second Timothy 1 verse 9 says it this way. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. There it is. It's not something that you have to prove to God or earn. Salvation is truly a gift and it's only the beginning. See, when we're saved because of God's grace, then we're given so much more. We're given our true identity and purpose. We have a new resource called Your Identity in Christ. It's amazing and it will really encourage you. Why don't you give us a call today at 1-855-759-0700 if you're seeking, if you're wondering like, what is the meaning of my life? And maybe looking towards other things or other people to define yourself. Give us a call. We want to pray with you. We want to give you a resource as well. Up next, a young man's miracle story after being struck in the head by lightning. Wow.
Watch this. What do I enjoy most about what I do? Well, that's easy. I love connecting with people, especially when someone says, I am so glad I can talk with you. I really need prayer. That's God's perfect timing. I talk with people all the time who want prayer for a family situation. Sometimes it's prayer for an emotional or physical need or even a financial breakthrough. It's so amazing that I can share about God's love and encourage people. I love this Bible verse, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. God is at work. I've seen him answer prayer. Won't you call today? 1-855-759-0700. God bless you. June 7, 2012 promised to be a beautiful day in Parkersburg, West Virginia. With clear skies and no sign of rain, it was perfect for a group at a church camp to have a pickup game of softball. But no one noticed the thundercloud that had rolled in, including 18-year-old Zach Sandy, who was in left field. Caleb Tisdale was pitching that day. There was a loud boom sound like a bomb going off. Uh, knocked me down to my knees. I jumped up trying to figure out what had happened, not really grasping what had taken place. Felt like somebody hit me on the back of the head with a two by four. Ralph Tisdale, also in the outfield, was one of several who were knocked down. The kids are running off the field screaming. He's spinning around and looking, everybody okay, everybody okay. And then I hear him say, oh my Lord. And, and then I glanced to where he's glancing and then left field, uh, Zach was down. I slid in on my knees next to him. Uh, I knew instantly this was going to be a horrible situation. He smelled like your charcoal grill in your backyard. His eyes were rolled back in his head, and he was locked stiff. Uh, he had smoke coming off of his body. I throw my phone to my wife and said, 911 right now. I'm doing CPR on him, and in between each breath while I'm doing compressions, I'm praying. I'm praying every prayer that I can think of, and I'm so afraid. Moments later, help arrived. The EMTs continued CPR as they loaded Zach into the ambulance. And all the preachers there put their hands on the ambulance and continued to pray. And while they're praying for him, uh, finally, after two or three minutes, the ambulance back doors bust open, and they say, we have a pulse. The EMTs said he may not make it through the night. His best chance was to be life flighted to the burn center in Pittsburgh, 100 miles away. But the storm was too severe. So he went by ambulance, still on a ventilator, to the hospital in Parkersburg. Zach's parents, Cherry and Russell, met him there. That's my baby laying there. And I have to pray and reach out to the Lord for him. Because as his mother, I'm to protect him. And if I could have taken his place that day, I would have. The small hospital in Parkersburg was not equipped to handle Zach. So with the storm still raging, an ambulance took him to the trauma unit in Morgantown. And his urine bag is just blood red, and they're telling us their initial diagnosis is kidneys are burned up, his liver and his lungs are gone. Doctors also suspected brain damage. All I remember is I started praying louder and louder and louder, and the whole uh, ER section of the hospital stopped and bowed their heads, and we're praying while we're praying. And while they're working on him, mom and dad just simply lay their hands on him and start praying. She prayed for two or three minutes, and she walked away, and she walked up to me, standing in the hallway with tears in her eyes, uh, and she just said probably one of the most profound statements of faith I've ever heard. I just said, this will be for the glory of God. And she gave me a big hug, and she said, everything's going to be all right. By this time, a prayer chain was well underway. I had to go back to camp and settle 120 kids down, and we had a prayer service just for Zach for probably 20 minutes of the service. Finally, the storm cleared, and Zach was life flighted to the burn center in Pittsburgh. At the first hospital, there was, we was worried about his kidneys. Well, the second hospital, there was a change in the kidneys. And then the third hospital, the kidneys were working fine. There was nothing wrong with them. And it was like you knew that prayer was going forth, and you could feel that it was being a, a change there. The next day, one day after the lightning strike, Zach woke up. He was in stable condition and breathing on his own. I just remember waking up and seeing my parents and seeing my brother. 
and you know, of course they've got tears in their eyes and I, I have no idea what happened, where I'm at. I, I'm just kind of looking around trying to, <laughs> okay, what, you know, what's going on? And I, I see that I'm laying in a hospital bed. He had none of the internal injuries that the doctors feared he would have. My first words were, I'm hungry. And my dad kind of laughed at that. And he said that he knew I was okay after that because I was always hungry. I believe it's a total miracle from heaven performed right in front of my eyes and, and in my own home. And I uh, be forever, ever thankful. Zach's doctor expected him to be in rehab a month, but he was out in one week with no side effects at all. I would go back for checkups and he'd walk in and say, say, the miracle man. And I'd just be like, no, 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 no. I'm the vessel. God's the miracle man. He's the one that performs the miracles. Today, Zach is on his way to earning his associate's degree in information systems technology. And there's no, no scientific reason, no, no logical explanation for why I'm sitting here in this chair today and able to talk. I'm able to put a sentence together. There's no logical explanation for that other than the fact that God had healed me. I do believe it's a miracle, nothing less than a miracle. Hey, how's it going? My name is Robin Waller. I'm the lead pastor at Lyft Church, a church on a mission to see churches thriving on our college and university campuses. Now, when you open up your phone or hop on your computer scrolling through Facebook, it seems like every day there's a new idea we need to listen to, a new thought coming in, a new movement happening, a new trend that we need to get on top of. And it, it, it can feel almost overwhelming at times, trying to decide, like, what do we listen to? Is this, do I follow this trend? Do I do this thing? It seems like every week there's a new idea. It, it can be totally overwhelming. How do you decide what to listen to? How do you decide what to follow? How do you decide what's even simply right and wrong? You know, over the years, as I've pastored people, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of students across our campuses, what I've discovered is that we tend to pick and choose what we listen to. Sometimes we'll listen to what we read about Jesus, sometimes we don't. We wait until we find the answer that we're looking for. But Jesus actually says something really, really beautiful to us in John 15. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants anymore because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything I have heard from my father. And so there's two things I wanna real quick, quickly draw out of this, uh, this scripture. The first is that Jesus' actual promise here is that we can know the heart of God. When we're asking that question, what do I listen to? What do I do? Jesus' promise, Jesus' statement, is that we can actually know who God is. We can know the right way by being a friend of Jesus, by being in relationship with Jesus. This is the beautiful invitation of what it means to be a Jesus follower, is that we can know the heart of God. We can know right from wrong. This is incredibly helpful because it means when we open up to our world, we open up our phones or our social media, there's an anchor in our lives that helps us navigate it. But there's a second part to this. It's not enough just to know the right way. We actually have to listen to the way of Jesus, allow him to dictate our lives, allow him to steer us. This is what it means to be a friend of Jesus. So Jesus' invitation isn't just to know what is right, to know the heart of God, it's to listen to the heart of God and to follow it. Well, how do you do that? What, what's the mechanism to do that? Really, really simply, it's just a matter of getting into the scriptures. God has spoken to us through his word, the Bible, the gospels. And I would encourage you, if you've kind of finding yourself not sure what to listen to, start to make sure that Jesus' voice is the loudest voice in your life. This is the invitation that I would put to you today, to be a friend of Jesus by listening to what he has to say to you from the scriptures, from his word, and then putting it into action today in your life. Hello, 700 Club partners. My name is Lana Bristow, and I graduated from the Windsor Life Center four years ago. For the last year and a half, I've been working as the kitchen manager at the Windsor Life Center. So on behalf of women like me, I'd like to thank people like you, because without people like you, I wouldn't be given this opportunity to be able to pour back into hurt and broken women. So thank you.
I just love what your gifts to this ministry does. It changes lives. Just like Shauna said, we are helping women find healing and purpose in their life. Have you joined us yet, becoming a partner? Will you help us share the gospel across this nation to hurting people? Only $20 a month gets you started and you can make a difference. Uh, call us at one 855 700 and as a thank you gift, we'll send you God is For Us. Pat Robertson reads powerful scriptures from the book of Romans. We'll be right back. CBN presents God is For Us, verses of salvation, peace, and victory from the book of Romans. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. God is For Us, a new audio recording by Pat Robertson, available now. Well, I hope that you were really encouraged today as you watch this show. And even as we leaned into some of the stories and the interview with Donna and with Kevin, I was reminded about the grace of God in our life. And really, to be honest, that difficult things happen. In fact, sometimes tragic things happen in our life. But scripture says that God's grace is available to the righteous and the unrighteous. You know, it doesn't, doesn't really matter where you are with God, the grace of God is available to you. And that is what is such a gift from God. And we have to be really honest, do we accept God's grace in our life? Well, Gervine sent a prayer request in and we love praying for people. And she said, please pray for my family to come to faith in Jesus. I have parents, a brother and sister who are yet to know Christ. Well, I believe there's many of you watching that you've been praying for family or friends to actually receive the grace of God. Yes, His grace is available to them, but have they received it for themselves? Let's pray together for those people that we love to come to Jesus. Father, I pray for Gervine's family here, that salvation would come to everyone in their household and that they would all turn to you, receive the grace that you extend to them. Lord, I pray for others who are praying for loved ones, that they, their loved ones would turn their hearts and their lives towards you, that they would be recognizing your grace is available to them, and they would turn to you and receive it, and they would find salvation and healing and freedom in Jesus' name. Well, I love this verse from 2 Corinthians 12, 9. It says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Oh, but the grace of God in our lives. Thanks for watching today. I hope you're encouraged. To contact us, visit 700club.ca. Tomorrow on the 700 Club Canada, a community prays as doctors rush to save a boy's arm and a young mother turns her life around after an encounter with God.